latest gathering of the legislative branch capacity working group. Thank you all for coming. And I'm glad we have a room where we can actually see the light of day as opposed to being in the basement of the CDC. So thank you to uh, the folks on my staff who were able to, uh, to get these digs. This is nice. Um, for those of you who are new, and I think I see a few new faces in the room, my name is Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute. Um, I am the co-founder, co-director of this, and two seats to my right is Lee Drutman of New America, who's the other co-founder, co-director. And um, as you probably picked up, we set this up as a specifically nonpartisan forum in which we can look at uh, the many, many different aspects of congressional capacity um, and think about what's working, what is not working about the institution, and what possibly can be done to make it work better. Today's topic is legislative procedure and congressional capacity. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, before we get on to today's topic, let me pass it over to Lee. Real quick, wants to speak about another thing. Uh, yeah. So, so quickly, um, uh, as part of the legislative branch capacity working group, we have a, a large network of political scientists, scholars of, of Congress, and as, as part of our efforts to understand issues of congressional capacity better, and uh, without some research that. We Kind of make broader cases for enhancing capacity, think about some ways in which uh, Congress could make recommendations or reforms that would, uh, that would be most effective. We've, we've sent out a survey um, to all staff. Now, at some point, uh, you may have gotten an email from Professor Tim Lapierre at uh, James Madison University um, uh, and with a link to a survey. And uh, we're hoping that you, if you haven't taken that survey, you'd be willing to take it. It's about 15 to 20 minutes. I know your time is valuable, um, but the insights that we gain from the survey will be incredibly valuable for us scholars who, who work on issues of congressional capacity. Um, and if you haven't received it or don't remember receiving it, uh, you can talk to me or email me. Um, uh, more broadly, if you would be willing, I know uh, there are some offices that have blanket policies about not participating in surveys, because there are a lot of junk surveys out there. Um, it's probably a good blanket policy, um, but you know, particularly it would be valuable anybody um, who has those policies, if they'd like to waive them for this survey, if there's anybody who might be willing to kind of just, just reach out to a broader network uh, to, to sort of say, this is, this is an okay survey, it's not a junk survey, these are real people who are wrestling with real questions, you know, so it's not, it's all anonymous, it's not any kind of gotcha thing here, we all care about the institution of Congress and want it to be great, so any help that you'd be able to offer, either just be, just taking the time to take the survey, or, you know, especially being willing, at, being willing to send it out to a broader network to say, you know, this is, this is a valuable survey. Uh, would, would really help our efforts. Uh, you know our model, make Congress great again. So thank you. All right, uh, so today's topic, legislative procedure, congressional capacity, uh, with a special focus on the Senate, and our speaker is Dr. Molly Reynolds, a fellow at Brookings Institution, and the author of this Brand new book on a topic that's pretty germane. Exceptions to the rule of politics of filibuster limitations in the U.S. Senate. So Molly is somebody who uh, is trained as a political scientist, uh, has all sorts of analytical tools uh, at her disposal, but really, really knows how the chamber works on a day-to-day -day basis and knows the nitty-gritty. Uh, so she knows something about the, law, the lives uh, that you all live uh, in dealing with the Senate. So with that, let me turn it over to Molly. Great. All right. Thanks, Kevin and Lee. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk for just a little bit. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the book. First, I'm going to talk about kind of generally how do I think we should think about procedure. And then at the end, I'm going to put a couple of questions on the table for discussion. Um, and I, in particular, would really like to hear from all of you, um, particularly those of you who work on the Hill, who have ever worked on the Hill, um, to get some um, reactions from you all about 
how should we think about the interaction between congressional capacity and legislative procedure? So to start off, just how should we think about legislative procedure conceptually? So when we hear members in the House and the Senate talk about procedure, they often talk about it in really principled terms. So lots of arguments about the traditions of the institution, what the institution is ideally supposed to look like, a lot of appeals to the idea of regular order. But I want to argue that really conversations about procedure are conversations about power. Um, who has the power? Um, what can be done as the result of certain actors having power and other actors not having power? And so when we, if we're going to think about procedure this way, I think when we talk about procedural change, both when we actually make changes to the standing rules of the House, to the standing rules of the Senate, to Senate precedents, so on and so forth, um, and about how we should think about changing, changing use of procedure, um, we should think about how, it, um, how we're shifting power around and importantly, what policy outcomes can be achieved as the result of changing the distribution of power through procedural change. So, um, as Kevin mentioned, I'm trained for political scientists. Um, political scientists um, have diff make different arguments about these kinds of questions. Um, in the House, I would argue that there's a, a kind of a pretty good general consensus that Procedural change reflects the short-term needs of the um, House Majority Party. So the House Majority Party will look to limit the rights of the minority in particular when the minority has the ability to make things difficult for the majority. Um, occasionally we'll see the House Majority try to open things up procedurally, um, but then often have to backtrack on that. Um, anyone who's watched uh, the politics of House appropriations bills over the past several years, this should feel really familiar. You, know, you have these um, appeals to regular order, one, maybe a couple bills will come to the floor um, under regular order, and then uh, the uh, leadership will, will change course because they, um, they feel like they're being, um, uh, they're being obstructed. Um, in the Senate, there are a couple different perspectives on how to think about procedural change, um, mainly because of disagreement about really how to think about the filibuster rule and cloture. Um, does the filibuster exist because a majority in the Senate wants it to exist? Does it exist because a majority has failed to, um, to change it? Um, James Walner, who's sitting down here, has a, has a new book who, um, who I think talks a little bit about how the majority may in fact be willing to tolerate the filibuster in pursuit of, of other ends. But one thing I would um, sort of highlight in all of these arguments is a degree to which I think people look at um, Congress, particularly in the Senate, and think of kind of reciprocal procedural warfare. So one side does something um, and kind of pushes the boundary until the other side just can't deal with um, whatever uh, the first combatant has tried, um, and then they will respond in some way. And this kind of um, tit for tat responsiveness um, helps explain the procedural environment we find ourselves in. Um, in terms of how Congress uses the procedures it has. I would argue that more restrictive procedures, again, like shutting down amendment processes, um, as controlled by the leadership, are really designed to, again, advance the interests of the majority party. And that can mean a couple different things. It might mean to insulate members from taking difficult votes. Um, it might mean that in trying to ensure that policy moves in the direction that's favored by the majority party. So my book is about one specific kind of procedure in the Senate, um, which looks at um, limitations on debate as enshrined in particular statutes. So in general, there are several sources for what governs how things play out on the Senate floor. There are the formal standing rules of the Senate, uh, there are the precedents, the interpretations of the rules, and then there are these laws that contain provisions governing debate. Um, and some of these um, have uh, restrictions that prevent the possibility of a filibuster on a future piece of legislation by stipulating a certain amount of time for debate. Um, they also will often limit amendments um, and the ability for things to get stuck in committee. Um, they, come, uh, they come with a non-debatable motion to proceed to ensure that uh, the measure actually gets on to the Senate floor. Um, in the book, I talk about two types of these. Um, one where uh, Congress will give power to someone else, either an actual inside or outside the chamber, to develop a, a proposal that Congress can't amend because Congress thinks it's politically important to get something done, but wants to avoid blame for whatever that is. 
Um, the McConnell rule and the debt limit is an example of this. I'll talk about more in a second. Um, the other category of these procedures are ones that help Congress oversee actions by the executive. So Congress often isn't well equipped to respond to presidential actions, so it can set up procedures that subject certain kinds of presidential action to congressional review. Um, an example of this that you may be familiar with is um, the Congressional Review Act, which was um, very popular here on the Hill Committee of the Year. Um, so in both cases, um, I argue that the underlying rationale for creating these new procedures is that preventing a filibuster um, will make the majority party better off, and the majority party will um, often be able to convince enough minority party members to help them um, change the rules, even if they um, think that keeping the overall filibuster in place is also good. So um, I also argue that when we have these uh, particular procedures, the Senate um, is going to use them uh, in order to make policy changes that are good for the majority party. So I look at budget reconciliation um, in the book, and um, I talk about how um, when the Senate is thinking about what to do with reconciliation, it thinks about the electoral needs of the majority party, uh, particularly in the context of which uh, members of the majority party are up for re-election in the next cycle. Um, but ensuring that the majority party stays the majority party isn't just about individual senators, it's also about the party's collective reputation. Um, and so we might think that when the party needs to deliver on um, a collective uh, promise, that's also going to affect how it uses the media. So why should we care? Um, uh, I don't need to remind anyone who watched what happened um, up here on the, on the hill over the summer about um, the relevance of the reconciliation rules. I am going to talk a little bit about the McConnell rule for a second, just because it's um, been, now that the debt limit is back in the news, um, I think it's, it's worth uh, using as an illustrative example here. So the McConnell rule uh, had two, two iterations, one in 20, it was adopted in 2011, one adopted in 2013. And the idea was that the president um, would be able to request an increase um, in uh, the debt limit, and that uh, action by the president could uh, uh, be disapproved of by Congress and that that joint resolution of disapproval um, couldn't be filibustered in the Senate. But even if the Senate and the House approved the joint resolution of disapproval, the president would have to sign it, it's a joint resolution. Um, and then assuming the president would veto, because um, the president wants to see the debt ceiling increased, um, you would need a, a two-thirds vote to override. So basically what this particular procedural innovation allowed Congress to do is it allowed members to continue to position take on the debt limit, continue to say, you know, I don't think we should raise the debt limit without corresponding um, spending cuts or budget process reforms, but uh, not have to worry about the actual consequences of um, failing to raise, raise the debt limit. So what does procedure mean for legislative capacity? So I want to sort of say, I want to argue there are two dimensions to think about here. One are opportunities. So in a restrictive procedural environment, one where um, members don't have as many opportunities to offer amendments, one uh, under the reconciliation process where there are limits um, on what can be included in the bill, um, it's harder for members to achieve certain individual goals that they have. So if you're you know, a rank and file member of the House and you, particularly in the minority, and you don't get any real chances to offer um, amendments on the floor, at least ones that aren't um, granted to you by the Rules Committee, that really limits your ability to kind of build your reputation, to do uh, the kinds of things you want for the legislative process. I sort of think here about kind of procedural knowledge, particularly among the staff. So in a restrictive procedural environment, even if you're a member and you want to try to achieve those goals, um, when the procedure is um, complicated and seems like a black box that's only controlled by the leadership, it's much harder for you to understand exactly how you would try and pursue your goals through the legislative process if you, if you feel like you don't understand what's happening procedurally. So one argument here would be that the current scope of legislative procedure and how it's used makes it harder for staff to do their jobs. So if you as a staff member have a goal of trying to help your boss achieve his or her goals, it's harder to do that if you can't offer amendments. Um, it is uh, harder uh, to do that in restrictive uh, procedural environments like the reconciliation process where there are limits on what can be included in the bill. Um, 
In the budget process in particular, um, I think for a lot of people it's simply not clear how the process works. Um, and I think many people feel like they're sort of in, in the dark about the details, which again can make it harder uh, to try to get what you want done. Um, I also think it's important to note that in a lot of cases, um, there's an incentive for uh, chamber leadership to try to withhold information. So there's a political scientist named Jim Curry who has a really wonderful book about this in the House, um, where he talks about how um, House leadership often uses things like self-executing rules to structure the legislative process to give them, the leadership, an informational advantage over rank and file members. Um, so under this idea, when rank and file members are more reliant on what leaders are telling them, um, the leaders will have more influence over their behavior. Um, I think we, he also argues that leaders will see this as a really attractive um, tool when members uh, when a bill is really important to members have the potential to seek outside sources of information. Um, and this works well for you if you're an individual member, um, if you trust that what the leadership is doing is also in your interest. Um, in a highly polarized Congress, we think that this is you know, probably going to be true a lot of the time. Uh, what's good for you as an individual member is also what's good for the party. But it's not always true, particularly if you're a member who's not always in step with your party's orthodoxy. So on the flip side, there's also an argument to be made that there's no real reason, if you're a staff member, to invest in learning the ins and outs of congressional procedure if you feel like the whole thing is sort of baked in. So if you have limited time and resources, um, and if we're going to just have a process um, where procedure is dictated by the leadership, why invest in learning about a hypothetical ideal process that's not going to be followed? Um, if you trust that um, those who do know procedure are trying to advance goals that are also in your interest, um, there's less of a need to try to assert your own um, informational advantage. I also think that um, in an era of um, what I call deadline-based legislating, so uh, where your Congress leaves things to the last minute and tries to use a deadline that has um, consequences uh, to uh, get itself into gear, uh, when things go down to the wire, you have to need, um, or you can argue that you need restrictive uh, procedures to keep whatever deal is reached at the last minute together. And if um, someone tries a procedural move that has the potential to undo that deal, there can be, um, there can be consequences. So that's one thing that I'd love to sort of get um, put on the table for discussion, this question of does the current procedural environment um, interfere with um, folks' ability to um, kind of get what, uh, to achieve the goals that um, they and um, the members that you work for um, out of the process. So what, what changes could we make to make sure that procedure isn't uh, inhibiting congressional capacity? So one thing I'd highlight here is that um, it's always important, I think, to think about the degree to which changing procedure um, can come with unintended consequences. So I've done some work, for example, on the Senate budget resolution and um, on efforts to limit um, amendments to the Senate budget resolution, particularly ones that don't have any um, real consequences, so things like reserve funds and sense of the Senate amendments. And one of the things that I found is that when uh, the Senate has tried to crack down on um, these kinds of amendments in one way. The underlying goals that senators are trying to pursue by offering those amendments don't just go away. They just try and find a different way to do the same thing on the floor. Um, and so I think that's important to remember. I think it's also important to ask what, if we feel like um, there's a disincentive to learn about procedure, why is that and what changes could we make? So um, things like in the budget process in the House, um, House members can only serve four out of six Congresses on the Budget Committee. Um, the House Democrats have additional restrictions that um, impose a three out of five um, Congress limitation. And does that disincentivize people from really becoming experts in the budget process if they know that they're only going to be on um, the committee for a short period of time? And are there, are there other things like this that, um, that people observe? So I'm going to stop there and we will open up. Alright, folks have questions? Comments? Comments? Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, Jean Fortewick from the Women Before the Women Foundation. Um, just if I can talk a little bit more about the 
Yeah, so um, the McConnell rule was first adopted as part of um, the Budget Control Act in 2011, um, which you may remember is what helped us resolve uh, the debt ceiling crisis in the summer of 2011, and um, also set us up for um, the current regime of discretionary spending caps um, that govern the uh, annual appropriations process at present. Um, and what the Budget Control Act did is it um, established, I believe, I'm looking at um, Phil because he may remember better than I do, three additional chances for President Obama to request an increase to the debt limit um, subject to uh, congressional disapproval. It's the three that I'm yeah, not remembering. The point that they raised it and then there were two. Yeah. Um, and so the, again, the idea here was that um, Congress was looking for a way to uh, uh, de-weaponize the debt limit a little bit and make sure that uh, it, would, it would get raised without uh, totally eliminating the ability of members of Congress to weigh in on the question of whether or not we should raise the debt limit. So, Members would still get to say, I support this, I don't support this. But by shifting uh, the uh, uh, reversion point, or what would happen in the absence of action from Congress to the executive branch, it reduced the chances that this would uh, we actually see a default. And then there was um, an additional uh, iteration of the model that was adopted in 2013 um, as part of the, um, the budget deal. Uh, Mike Stern, point of order. Um, that's my website. I wasn't actually making a point of order. Just, um, um, it would be so okay if you made that choice. Was, um, so, Molly, I, did, in your work, did you do you draw a distinction, or have you thought about what rules? You say members talk about rules in principled fashion, but it really is about power. But there are certain rules that members accept because they are the rules, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so how does how do they cross that threshold? I mean, what if, for, let me take an example, which is judging elections, right? If members wanted to, right, the majority party could decide all election contests in their own favor, and they don't do that. They rec they recognize some area of legitimacy of the rules. Procedures that are part of their immediate interests. So, is there a point at which members cross that line? Which rules do they accept as binding? Is it the rules, even if they yeah. don't like them and they don't help them right now? Yeah. And which ones do they recognize as just that you manipulate our best future? Yeah, I think different people have <clears throat> different uh, perspectives on this question. What I would argue is that um, the ones that members um, eventually look to change are the ones that are getting used against them and the interests of their party in a way that has become just so frustrating and obstructive to getting what they want done. So I think if you want to think of, I think a good illustration of this is how do we get to the point where we, where Democrats actually invoked the nuclear option in the Senate um, in the fall of 2013, and then um, when uh, Republicans responded uh, in this, this spring by invoking the nuclear option to confirm Gorsuch. So in 2013, we had gotten to a point where Democrats felt like they just were not getting anywhere on judicial nominations, and that they weren't there was, they had no alternative to um, making a procedure than to make a, a procedural change. Um, I agree with you that there are that there are some that um, definitely are uh, held up as uh, much more much more uh, sacrosanct uh, than others. Um, but I, I guess that's what I, that's what I would say. But like I said, I think there are other people. Other people might have different perspectives on that. <laughs> Thank you, um, and thanks, Lee and Kevin. Uh, my question is about um, trying to bring in a broader political constituency or a civic constituency for process, for the sort of processes in democracy. And it seems to me, I work, I'm at Georgetown with a lot of students, and 
it seems to me that the technology and the sort of data visualizations and supply chain transparency that we have now makes the explanatory um, value of the process of Congress far more easily grasped, more apprehensible. And you even see the Library of Congress putting really neat process videos up, and some members are linking to explanatory <coughs> videos of what we're actually doing there, and that is a hugely important piece of um, getting Americans sort of reinvested in civics and democratic institutions. So my question is, who is not showing up um, in the most effective way that they could right now to create a more viable political constituency for the procedures and the, especially the, the deliberative process because Congress is really only doing about 50% of its hearings right now and that's another major cutoff of members' ability to build social capital and peer networks and issues outside, you know, authority on issues outside the leadership. Who's not showing up effectively right now that you would suggest? Yeah, so I guess one, I'm going to say two things here. One is to go back to what I said at the start, which is that when we think about process, we really should be thinking about kind of who has the power um, and who gets the power as a result of the procedures that exist. So it's um, building a constituent, part of why building a constituency around process is hard is because I don't, I think that if we bill it as a constituency around process, that ignores the consequences of the process that we're using. Um, the other thing that I would say about um, procedure uh, and kind of trying to open it up to the public is that one thing that can be challenging, and it gets to this point of procedure feeling really complicated even to people who work on the Hill, is that this is an area where a little bit of knowledge incorrectly applied can lead you to really wrong conclusions. So I don't know what this, because not everyone pays as much attention to the reconciliation process as I do. Um, this, this particular um, incident may have uh, not created um, a stir for you, but right after um, the uh, Senate, uh, right after um, the Senate uh, considered the um, ACA repeal and replace bill this summer, and uh, John McCain voted no on um, on the amendment, uh, on the last amendment, there was this um, Reddit thread that was going around the internet um, that suggested that perhaps um, John McCain was being strategic and he had voted yes to open debate. Um, only because he wanted to expend all of the debate time and then vote no at the very end, and that would kill the reconciliation vehicle for the year. That is not the correct interpretation of what um, was happening, and so there was there was this moment where um, people um, taking a little bit of knowledge about how the process works and the idea that there are limitations on the reconciliation process to reach this conclusion um, really led um, led folks astray. And so I think that's part of why um, it's part of why it's it's hard to um, to build I think a, a constituency and um, get people to feel like they understand this process because it's so complicated. And if you um, you do run the risk of um, a little bit of knowledge applied poorly leading you to a wrong conclusion. Yeah. Uh, Matt Glassman, Government Affairs Institute. Maya, I loved your book. I'm so glad smart people like you are writing books like that. that Thank awesome. you. Um, I'm interested in kind of the, the broader picture here is that when I think about procedure and capacity, I think too many people focus inside Congress on who has the power, the leaders, the committee system, the individuals, and how that is. But to me, it's much more about the aggregate power of the institution in the separation of power system. How do the rules of Congress affect the power of Congress vis-a-vis -vis the president? Um, and the legitimacy of Congress in the, in the public sphere as they engage the president in kind of separation of powers fights. And the thing you hear going around town and in the public now is that if Congress doesn't get rid of its veto players, it will be irrelevant because the president will start taking executive actions to fill in the gap. Um, if there's just gridlock, well, then the president will find ways to do things on immigration, on trade, on any, any, any number of things. But to me, that, that strikes me you know, kind of just at a gut level as just dead wrong and that Congress's power within the system has to do with the veto players and that kind of a democratized Senate or a majoritarian institution with powerful leaders, you know, with the, you know, kind of reality of the modern Congress, the agenda setting would all come from the executive branch, kind of that second face of power, what, you know, and the policy making would be shifted out of Congress to the executive branch and Congress would just kind of become this rubber stamp. 
Um, whereas strengthening the veto players and distributing the power throughout Congress would allow for a much tougher time for the executive to roll, to, to roll Congress. And so I, I, I get very worried that people are heading towards this idea of streamlining the system um, when what they're really doing is just letting the uh, president further into the hen house to become kind of the legislative leader of Washington. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I think that that, um, I think that's a really great point. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is actually the way that the kind of procedural change I study, in certain cases, enhances Congress's ability to stand up to the president. Um, and when Congress gives itself, when Congress says, you know, we're going to make certain actions by the president subject to legislative review, and we're going to make this trade-off where we have expedited procedures, particularly in, in the Senate, that allow us to do this more easily, it's in part because it will help us get, um, help us ensure that what happens is better reflective of our preferences as a branch, as the president. Um, I, I want to make sure that I, I'm not saying, I think in any, uh, in any real way, that uh, somehow I think the, the process is definitely too complicated. I think it's about trying to find a way to make sure that uh, folks who are working in the institution understand what it is that's happening and don't feel like they're at a disadvantage because they don't understand how that institution is working. Thank you. Here's a yeah. follow-up question. That's excellent. Question. Um, I mean, it seems like there have been events in the past week that, that, that kind of speak to this this point, um, and, and I just wonder if you could, from you know, from the way you think about things, if you can play, I mean, the, the president just just ruled leaders of his own party, and then they just went along with it. So it suggests that there's some. I mean, the president has become an important. And it's not this point about agenda setting, right? I mean, so like, I don't know if you could just sort of take us through a little bit of. of of how how later McConnell or, or, or Ryan kind of kind of views their, their their strategic options and why members, even Republican members, you know, just sort of go along. It seems like a lot of them didn't like the deal that, that Ryan and McConnell made, but they went along with it. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily view this as a procedural question, um, but I'm happy to I'm happy to answer it. So I think there, I mean, there are a couple different ways to read what happened last week. I think one of them um, is that, uh, or I guess the way that I would probably one way that I might read it is to say that um, in the current environment where there are a number of um, Republicans, especially in the House, who um, were not going to be willing to vote for um, a debt limit increase that did not come with accompanying other changes that gave um, Democrats more leverage. Um, and so I guess I'm sort of of the mind that we were eventually going to get to a deal or something we were going to get to a deal that looked something close to like what happened um, last week, and the surprising thing was that Trump came out early and quickly for that deal, as opposed to several weeks of, um, of fighting about it. But I think there are um, there are smart people who have different ways to read what happened. I think that's where I would come down. Uh, Josh, Josh, um, Government Affairs Institute. I uh, I think. One of the things that you said is, is really important and it brings up a particular problem that we sort of haven't gotten our hands around, and that is that you, you aptly point out that members have goals, they want to achieve those goals, whether it's through the amendment process or whatever they want to do, um, uh, but they're increasingly not able to pursue those goals through the legislative process because the legislative process is increasingly shutting them out from influence, right? You can't offer amendments. The committee system is weaker than it has been in a long, long, long time, for example. So my question is, is, why in your estimation do members and, and, and senators seem, seem to not care about their own power to do it? So I don't think that I would say they don't care. Um, I think that they, um, in a lot of cases, they end up deciding that they care more about being protected from taking tough votes than they do about what they would get if they have the ability to exercise that power individually. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's a permanent, necessarily a permanent state of affairs, um, but I do think it's something that uh, that helps um, us explain kind of where we are now, um, and that uh, yeah, I think that's that's where I come down. 
Hercules Partnership for Public Service. With the president recently uh, tweeting about procedure and all, like, what, two or three times since he took office, have you, and this might be a question for you, but maybe also for the Hill staffers, but have you found that there is increased interest in learning about the procedure or learning about what options there are there? What what reception have you heard from these like very public statements about procedure? Yeah, I mean, uh, while using having the president use Twitter to call for the end of the Senate filibuster is a little <coughs> unique. Um, the idea that uh, members um, and political actors blame procedure for why we can't get things done isn't new. I mean, you hear House members, for example, all the time complain about how what prevents uh, Congress from doing what they want is the Senate filibuster. Um, you know, they, they love to complain about the filibuster as being the thing that stands in their way. Um, so I think that uh, while sort of the, the president elevating it uh, in the way that he has is um, is interesting and notable, the idea that, you know, the, the way that he's done it in saying that the, the, uh, the filibuster is to blame for Republicans not getting things done, like that's not necessarily new. Do you think he'll move the needle that like the other people will begin to also look at changing these, or is it more of just like a generic complaint? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's likely to, to move the needle on things. Um, I think that particularly in the Senate, at the end of the day, if there are, uh, if there aren't 50 senators plus the uh, vice president who want to make a change, then it doesn't much matter what the president says. Hi, I'm uh, Max Spitzer. I'm with the uh, House Parliamentarian's Office. Um, in terms of uh, demystifying the House rules, I just want to do with advertising for our office. That is kind of the whole point of our office is to demystify the rules. So obviously members, uh, staffers can call up the office, get expert procedural advice. Um, uh, you can contact uh, me if the main office is busy. Um, I work over in the publications office, so if you've uh, never seen House Practice, I edited that last volume. Uh, it's got a lot of information, very uh, arranged topically. You can find it pretty easily. Um, you, uh, Dr. Reynolds talked about uh, procedure and, and power. Um, the only comment I will make is that uh, I think underlying the House rules, maybe not every single rule, but there is kind of a good government reason behind the rules, even if they are complicated and if they've changed uh, due to responding to, to power issues. But at the base, there are sort of idealistic notions about uh, you know giving people debate time, uh, layover requirements so that members can uh, uh, review legislation. Um, they, these sort of underlying procedural values are there underlying the system, even if power players are coming at it and trying to achieve particular goals. Yeah, so first of all, everyone, pretty good you work in the house, you should take advantage of Max's offer. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that uh, I think that what Max's point um, makes uh, makes clear that's important to remember is kind of the difference between what's on paper and then how the rules get used. And so things like the layover requirement, you know, it exists in the rules and um, in an ideal world, everything that came to the floor of the House would get the 72 hours um, uh, labor requirement, but in the House, that can be waived um, if a majority of the House supports doing so. And so that's a place where kind of there's a gap between uh, what the rules say and how we think that um, the authors of them intended for them to work and how they actually get used in practice. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Toby Morsi. Right now, I work at the executive office of the president, although I'm here because I'm a former member of the House Office of the Council, and I'm interested in this debate. Uh, I'm wondering if you can, if you can tell us where, where are we headed? Uh, are, based on sort of institutional history, not just like what's been going on. Like, are we? Is this is the sort of is the Senate on a collision course with with itself, where it's going to end up, uh, where it's sort of just in a, in a death spiral where it's going to end up looking a lot like the House procedurally? Or does this sort of thing run in cycles where after the Senate uh, you know, re-energize some, some of its rules and, and begin to treat them a little more, uh, more bigger? Yeah, so. Or, or do we just not? 
It's a, it's a great question. Um, I cannot predict the future. If I could, um, I would have a different job than the one that I do. But um, I'll, say, I'll say a couple of things. One is that I would argue that over the course of the 20th century, um, we have seen in the Senate kind of a slow progression to the place where we are now, which is um, obviously not a majoritarian body, but in certain circumstances, um, changes that make the operations of the Senate more majoritarian. I do not think, however, that we are that the Senate is headed to a place that looks like the House. And I think that's in part because of institutional differences between the House and the Senate that will not change with the rules. And I think um, the difference in the size and scope of Senate versus House constituencies is really important here. And I think a difference in um, the length of um, terms is really important here. So those are fundamental institutional features that make the chambers different that I think um, are part of why the Senate um, even a Senate where uh, you did need only 51 votes to do everything, um, I don't. I don't think would ever look quite like the House. Any other questions? It's another great question, um, and I don't, uh, I don't have a good kind of empirical answer for you on how much time Congress spends doing one thing versus the other now. Um, but I think that you've hit on a really important point, which is that you know, you all are, pretty, I mean, you all who work on the Hill are humans with a fixed amount of capacity in your day. The people you work for are humans with a fixed amount of capacity in their day, and when you. Uh, when Congress needs to spend more time doing one thing, it comes at the expense of doing something else. I mean, it's the basic opportunity cost of doing business. And so um, if we are in a place where Congress collectively thinks it needs to be paying more attention to the executive branch, whether or not we're actually in that place, um, I don't know. But it does. I would argue that it, it just by virtue of how much time is available does mean there may be less time for Legislating, and so um, I think that uh, again, I'm not sure this is sort of a procedural question, but I think that it is an important thing to think about when we um, consider kind of where Congress's capacity is and how it wants to use that. Sure. Hi, I'm Richard Skinner. Uh, in the past few years, it feels like it may be coming towards the end of a phase in government. Uh, Congress, where we had a like a generation of party government based on a fairly unified uh, majority party, particularly the House, that's able to vote for these preferences. Obviously, the Senate is different, but I think these are some of the interesting trends there. Um, but in the past few years, you've seen this growing division between the Republican Party, particularly the House Freedom Caucus and other conservatives who just don't want to compromise on anything. And that has, in many ways, diminished the ability of the Republican Party, uh, especially for the House of Representatives. Do you think that this is eventually going to take us to a place where this trend in the House was concentration of power and party leadership? Uh, it's going to start reversing itself. I think it's getting people realize that the Republican Party, at least the Republican Party, uh, can't govern the House in the same way that it could at any point. Yeah, so I think this gets um, to the point that I was making about uh, leaders' uh, uh, incentive to try and have a restrictive procedural environment and to control the information. And that works well when um, 
individual members think the leaders are looking out for them and doing what it is that's in their best interest and what they want, as well as the best interest of the party. And when those things don't necessarily align, we, we get to a point where it's uh, where members are, are much less willing to tolerate a restrictive procedural um, environment. In terms of kind of where we're going, I think it'll be interesting um, to think about, and we talked about this, I think, a fair amount after, right after um, Paul Ryan became speaker and kind of promised to open back up the up the house, and the question of whether he was willing to pair that with an increase in congressional capacity, because if you have kind of if you say we're going to devolve more power back to the committees, like committees work on things, have everything go through committees, but don't actually also invest in giving committees the resources they need to do that, that becomes sort of an empty promise. And it doesn't necessarily help you. Uh, it doesn't much matter if you've opened back up the process if the uh, if the committees don't have the resources they need to do the work. And in some ways, I think thinking about procedures the same way. Is that, you know, you can have a more open procedure, but if people don't understand it and know how to work with work within those confines, it's not nearly, it's not going to be terribly effective in helping members feel like they are advancing their individual goals. Use, use my host's uh, privilege here to ask Molly a question, which um, between now and the end of September, what sort of interesting moments is the Senate going to have procedurally, or is it just going to be easy peasy? <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything that happens on Capitol Hill these days should ever be called easy peasy. Um, but uh, I mean, I do think that the fact that um, Congress was able to reach uh, an agreement last week on the debt ceilings, DR, um, disaster relief spending, um, Trifecta uh, helped uh, uh, take a little bit of the pressure off for the the coming uh, the coming weeks. Um, it's as uh, as far as I know the next the next plan in the Senate is to take up the defense authorization bill. So um, that's one of the actually I mean people might disagree with me, but that's a part of uh, Senate deliberation that's continued to work pretty well and over the past couple of years. It's a thing they continue to do every year. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything in particular that I'm watching over the next couple of weeks. Maybe I should, um, but I think that uh, the um, the fact that they were able to avoid default and avoid a government shutdown in the first week of September is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a good sign. Yeah. How do you think about the um, uh, House Freedom Caucus and other kind of groups that are organizing on the floor? Uh, within the procedural environment, because I have this kind of instinct that this is sort of an expression of how when you centralize power in the House, these groups just kind of appear on the floor, no different than the progressives under Cannon. Uh, but part of me thinks this is also sort of a modern phenomenon, that um, be it the internet or the trappings of kind of modern communications, that constituents for these sorts of groups have become more aware, and that the nationalization of the parties has created this out there where they're not going away. And if we decentralize stuff like the committee, that wouldn't kind of reduce the idea of Blue Dogs or House Freedom Caucus pushing their muscle around on the floor? I think I would say both in response to your question. So I agree with you that the idea of uh, uh, intra-party factions trying to exercise power on the floor is, is not new. Um, but I do think that there's something different um, in the contemporary environment about um, the expectations that outside groups um, and constituents have for how members will use their procedural rights. So um, my Brooklyn's colleague, Sarah Binder, um, has long argued that part of what contributed to the um, increased use of the filibuster since the mid-70s is this expectation that individual senators exploit all of the procedural rights that they have to try to get what they want out of the process. And that using your procedural rights on the floor of the Senate is not always about changing uh, the underlying content of the bill. It's often about signaling to external audiences that you're doing the thing that they're in favor of. Um, and I think that we are, I think the House Freedom Caucus um, in this more modern um, media environment is doing the same thing, um, is that you know there are, uh, 
people are paying more attention to every single action um, that members are engaging in, particularly uh, interest groups. And so um, the, the expectations that members will use all of the tools at their disposal, I think, have, have increased. So I will just say that these were all great questions, and it was really great to get a chance to talk to all of you about this. And um, if you, particularly if you are a, um, a Hill staffer and you have thoughts on this question of um, how does capacity uh, interact with the procedure, I'd, I'd love to still hear about them. And so you should feel free to get in touch with me. Thanks.